Let's take our Bibles and look in Joshua chapter 2. And I want to read this portion here as it deals with the Lord's mercies toward a woman from Jericho by the name of Rahab, known in Scripture as Rahab the harlot. And yet the Lord was merciful. So that's the title of this message, Rahab the harlot. And we have here the Lord's merciful dealings with a woman that would be considered a Gentile, a non-Jew. Just like later he would deal with Ruth, the Moabites. These examples are given to us in Scripture to show us that no case is too hard with God and that he is pleased to save whom he will. But there are lessons in here concerning Rahab in the same manner that he's been pleased to save such as Rahab and Ruth and others. We find that if we're the Lord's in our experience as to how he's dealt with us, this is how he has saved us. So I'll read this. It's a little bit lengthy from verse 1 down to verse 22, and then I'll make some comments. Here it says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. So here we have the Lord preparing now to bring the children of Israel into this promised land and under the leadership of Joshua, not Moses. The Moses cannot cause any, the law cannot cause any to enter into that promised rest. Joshua here is a type of Christ. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho saying, behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. I know there are some legalists, when they read this, they say, well, she should not have lied. And so they find fault with Rahab. But this is one of those situations, even as Peter declared, judge for yourselves whether it's better to obey God or men. These are men's laws and men's impositions, but where there's a conflict with what God has ordained, with what God has purposed, then we do what God directs. And here Rahab was being directed by the Spirit of God to protect these men. And it came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out. Whether the men went, I wot not, pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. So she was misdirecting these that sought the lives of these two men, but it was according to God's purpose. And she had brought them up to the house, the roof of the house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. These roofs were flat, built back in the day, a couple of stories, and then this is where they dried their products. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. That's quite a statement there of faith. How is it that she knew that the Lord had given them the land. Well, she had heard witness of how the Lord had directed 
the children of Israel all the way through the desert and now was bringing them to this place. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So we have here a declaration of how it is that she is acting as she is. It's because of the Lord. I know that the Lord hath given you the land. How do we know anything of God's will and God's purpose and God's promises? It's through the spirit of God teaching us. And then that word know is in the sense of experientially knowing in the heart. And she says and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard, there it is, we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. That goes all the way back even before the 40 years that Israel wandered in the desert. For you, there's that work of God on behalf of his people. When you came out of Egypt and what you did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we have heard, there it is again, these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now when she says here, we did hear, She's speaking of herself and her family. She's not speaking of everybody there in Jericho. There were many that heard of the exploits of the Lord in preserving Israel all those years and bringing them to this land who were not moved as was Rahab here. And here I would interject, why is it that you suppose that God directed these two men to her? Well, it's because she was one of God's elect and it was necessary that the Lord bring specifically to her the promises that these men would give her to preserve her and her family alive. Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that ye will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token. So here we have the source of faith, which is the word of the Lord, and the spirit giving the hearing. We have also the evidence of faith, and that is where she declares for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. It begins with who God is. People arguing today about whether God is sovereign or not. If they're arguing, then They've been left to their own devices, their own blindness to this point. There's none that God has revealed himself in by his spirit that have any argument at all about who God is and how all things are to his honor and glory and that of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that we live and move and have our being in him. God receives all the glory. That's faith's evidence confessing that he is Lord and confessing his son, the Lord Jesus Christ as all, because that's who Christ is to his father. Christ himself said that God the father judges no man, but has put all judgment into the hands of the son. So this is faith's evidence. This is how you know that one has been taught of the Lord. You don't have to guess. We're not asking people to go back to some profession they made, whereby they walked an aisle or said a prayer, and somehow that's how they believe that they're the Lord's. What are they testifying concerning God? Here in this one statement is something that's rare today. They say that God is in control. You'll hear that term being used, but when you pursue that further, with these, you find out that it's not the God of Scripture, that he directs in every detail, and that nothing lives or moves or has its being but in him, not only in creation, but in providence, in his sovereign outworking of his will, in salvation, that it's not determined by man, but 
by God alone and in condemnation, judging whom he will, saving whom he will, judging whom he will. See, they want a God who's in control. It's kind of like a person learning to drive. You've got the steering wheel, but the driver's ed teacher is there just in case something happens. That's not God. There's that popular song that was sung a number of years ago, Jesus take the wheel. And that's most people's perspective that when something starts to go wrong, that's when God's in control and he's going to take over and direct. No, he directs all things to his honor and glory. So to me, this here reveals that this is a true confession of faith and herein is the evidence in this simple statement. But then when she speaks here, give me a true token. Give me something that in times and seasons of uncertainty will be a true token that indeed God will do what he has said. And that ye will, verse 13, save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. It was her burden and her concern that if the Lord should be merciful to her, that indeed he would also to her household. God doesn't have to save anybody, but here was the cry for mercy that the Lord had put in her heart. That's what true prayer is. It's that which is generated by the spirit of God. And it's the Lord that directs us to pray for certain ones. And if he so directs, there's a reason. We don't just pray generally, God save so-and-so. But there's times when the Lord will burden us for different individuals and that burden doesn't go away. And I've often said to different ones, well, if the Lord's burdened you, it must be the Lord. Because if it's not his will and purpose, he'll take away that burden. We can only pray as the spirit directs those prayers. And the men answered her, our life for yours. See, here we have these men being representative of witnesses of God in Christ, testifying the truth. We're not out there just making false promises to people that if you'll just do this or that, then you'll be saved. But he says, our life for years, if ye utter not this our business, and it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Here's a message of grace and mercy that when we speak to sinners, if the Lord is pleased, to so deal with you as you've dealt with us in kindness. You see, those whose hearts the Lord has tendered, they're kind to the Lord's servants. They're kind to those that bring the gospel message of Christ. And uh, they desire to be one with them. And so when the Lord hath given us the land, you see, there's no question there's not if the Lord gives us the land then no, when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee then she let them down by a cord through the window for her house was upon the town wall and she dwelt upon the wall and she said unto them get you into the mountain lest the pursuers meet you and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned and afterward may you go your way. And the men said unto her, we will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window. So here we see the scarlet line, that scarlet thread, that scarlet robe, that was its color, in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's house hold home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head. Now that house becomes a picture of Christ of dwelling in him and not going back out. 
but remaining there where God has purposed to show his grace and his mercy. And he said, if they go back out in the street, his blood shall be upon his head. The same thing can be said of any that have heard of Christ and even read of him in the scriptures and yet are turned away to pursue their own way, their own works. There's no salvation there. And any such will bear their own guiltiness because the only satisfaction is in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one good news that we find in scripture is that all that the Father has given him shall come to him. And of all that the Father has given him, he shall lose nothing. So as we're going to see here with Rahab and her family, the Lord so directed their hearts that when they were brought into that house and that scarlet robe remained there in that window, this is a type and picture of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, and whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And the people ask the preacher, well, how can you be so sure that what you're declaring is the truth? Well, don't believe it for my sake, but believe it for what God declares here in this word. And that if this is not true, then that blood be upon my head. That's why in preaching, I, by God's grace, stick with this one message of Christ and him crucified. Because therein is salvation. That's what God has promised. This is the message to those that are perishing. It's foolishness. But to those that are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. The blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one righteousness. He came and earned and established it. And God, when Christ had laid down his life, imputed it to the spiritual account of every one that he purposed to save. Just like this Rahab. And the men told her, if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. In other words, when the Lord does a work of grace, there's no betraying of those who are preaching it. We're going to face opposition. We're going to face persecution. But those that are the Lord's are united to care for one another and protect one another, even as they did even in the first century. If you've ever read that book on the catacombs and where those that were persecuted and pursued would hide out in the caves, and that's where they had to dwell. That's where the development of the fish came, which today has become nothing but a popular symbol of supposed Christianity. Back then, it was a mark from the Greek name of the Lord Jesus Christ, how it was put together to indicate where these believers met. And they protected one another. Anybody that's been through any type of persecution knows and understands how those that are the Lord's care for one another, look out for one another. And she said, verse 21, according to your word, so be it. Don't you love that testimony? I'm not here declaring unto you anything that I've come up with. We don't speculate or surmise, no, but declare the word. And those that are the Lord's, that's what they say. That's what the word Amen means, so be it, according unto your words, amen. And she sent them away, and they departed. And I love this. She bound the scarlet line in the window. That line was not going to be moved. Again, scarlet representing the color of blood, a representation of the, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby... God's people are delivered. And they went and came under the mountain and abode there three days and all till the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout all the way and found them not. That was God's purpose. And when you go over to Joshua chapter 6 in verse 17, you read there the declaration that 
Joshua declared as they were about to take the city. In verse 16, it says, And it came to pass at the seventh time they walked around the city, seven days and the last day seven times, when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed, even it, and all that are therein to the Lord. But look at here, I love this. Only Rahab, the harlot, shall live. She and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you go down to verse 22. But Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, go into the harlot's house. What, what a joyous reunion. Now that the city is taken, uh, he directs these to go back into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swear unto her. Can you imagine when they showed back up? What a joyous reunion that was. And so, verse 25, Joshua saved Rahab, the heart of the life, and her father's household, and all that she had, and she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day. That's the glorious thing that we find now that not only had God been pleased to save her, but grafted her in as a Gentile to the household of Israel because she had hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Our interest in Rahab, the harlot, and this story is enhanced even more so by the number of times that she's mentioned in the scriptures. It would be sufficient even to have one mention as with the Samaritan woman where Christ said, I must needs go through Samaria. But here, besides what we're reading here in the book of Joshua, if you go over to the book of Matthew with me, in Matthew chapter 1 and verses 5 and 6, here's what is even more of a blessing concerning this woman, this harlot. Someone asked, well, if the Lord redeemed her, why does she retain the name harlot, why is she always called Rahab the harlot? Well, it's because that's her testimony, that when the Lord found her, that's what she was and uh, redeemed her and was merciful and gracious unto her, the sinner. Even Paul himself never stopped declaring himself to be the sinner, even when he wrote to Timothy and said, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He doesn't say whom I was, whom I am. Any that are the Lord's are not going to push back at this title. That's our name, even as the Lord's, sinners saved by grace. But here in Matthew chapter one, you can see in verse five, it says, and Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, that's the word Rahab. You see that? And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So not only did the Lord deliver and save Rahab, the harlot, and her household. And even as it's declared there in Joshua, she continued to dwell in the land until this day. But what we read here is that she was the wife of Salmon. That's not Solomon, but Salmon, a prince of the tribe of Judah. And she was Boaz's mother and the great, great grandmother then of King David. What a beautiful thing that we're seeing unfold here. Now, when you get over again to Hebrews chapter 11, here's where we find her. This is how we know that God's promises are sure because we find her mentioned over here in what I like to refer to or others have of the hall of faith, not of fame, but of faith. 
And everyone mentioned here is taken out of the Old Testament as an example of how God by his grace saves sinners. There's not two ways of salvation. Those of the Old Testament weren't saved in any other way. They were given that faith to look to the Lord Jesus Christ who would come and accomplish their salvation. They lived under God's forbearance. He did not impute to them their sin because he had purposed that that sin should be imputed to his son when his son would come and work out their salvation. One time, one place, one sacrifice, one savior. And uh, upon completion of his death, all those who were the lords from the Old Testament and all those since were delivered and saved and justified there at the cross. God purposed it from eternity, but it was accomplished in time. And so here in Hebrews, in this hall of faith, we find her mentioned right along with Abraham and Isaac and Moses. Look in verse 31 of Hebrews 11. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. What greater testimony need we than that which the Lord Jesus Christ reveals of his own here in the scriptures. And even James, if you go over to James, just one book over, one epistle over James, he gives two illustrations of true faith, evidenced by one's submission to God and to his will, Abraham and Rahab. So Abraham is not to be elevated above Rahab the harlot. This is how God does in his grace. We all are the Lord's by his election. And that salvation that we share is by the redemption worked out by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the same spirit that draws each one to Christ. Here in James and chapter two, in verses 20 through 25, there's some people that, thinks that James is simply a, a book of works. Well, where there's faith, there's going to be that evidence, that outworking of that faith that God has revealed in the heart of his elect. Here in verse 20 of James 2, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? It's often here about simple profession of faith as he declares up in verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God? I would say that's the majority of people today that profess to be the Lord's and his children. They, well, I believe God, I believe in God. He says thou doest well, but the devils also believe and tremble. You can believe that this Bible is the inspired word of God. You can believe that God created all things. You can believe that God sent his son into this world to save sinners. You can believe that Christ came, lived, died, rose again and ascended on high. You can believe all that by way of information and still not believe more than the devils believe and tremble. There's a difference. There's a profession today that's simply based on information. But there's no trembling, even in the, in the sense that the devils tremble, knowing they're just in, in condemnation. But the question is asked, wilt thou know, o vain man, that faith without works is dead? A simple profession is vanity. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? And there's where people say, ah, see, justification is by works. But what Abraham is declared here as being justified by works, it's not before God. Paul had already established that back in Romans chapter four, that if Abraham, were in any way to be justified 
before God, it would be because of the work of God. In Romans chapter 4, keep your finger here in James, but in Romans chapter 4, what shall we say then that Abraham our father has pertained the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. So here Paul's declaring justification by God, just as other places of scripture declare that God is the one who justifies. So is there a conflict in scripture? No, here in verse 21, you have to keep it in the context that it's speaking of what justified Abraham's faith before man. The only thing they had to see was his works. And specifically here, it says in verse 21, when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar, that his works, as the Lord directed him up on that Mount Moriah, which years later, God caused Solomon to build his temple there. And then years later, caused the Lord Jesus Christ to come into that temple. And it was on that mountain that God sacrificed his own son, Abraham offering Isaac was but a shadow and a type of that. But Isaac didn't die, but God reserved that for his son. But all of that was evidence of the faith that God had given to Abraham, whereby even Christ said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. So here it talks about what justifies our faith before man. We can talk all day long about being the Lord's. But what justifies it is what motivates us by the Spirit of God to live out our lives to the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, who came and gave his life a ransom for sinners such as we are. That's what's being declared here. And verse 22, seest thou how faith wrought with his works? Abraham would not have gone to that mountain and to the point of offering up his son had not that faith been working in him. And that's what causes us to separate ourselves out from the world, even in our manner of worship. Why do we worship God? Because that was an act of worship that Abraham was doing that testified of that faith that God had given. And here, seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect. It's not that faith was his justification, but there the word perfect means complete. That in that faith, and that's what people see that around us, they don't understand this persuasion that God has given us, but it comes from the spirit that we cannot join with them, that we cannot worship with them in any other way. And therein, by that work or those works, faith is made complete or is fulfilled and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God he believed God it takes God revealing himself and it was imputed unto him for righteousness it wasn't that his faith was imputed unto him for righteousness but unto that word for means unto the righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ would come and accomplish and therefore he was called the friend of God. But verse 24, here's where we see Rahab tied with Abraham, no difference. You see then how that by works a man is justified. There again, before men, not before God. Sinners are only justified in Christ before God, but before men and not by faith only, not just mere profession. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works. What, what justified Rahab as being one of the Lord's? It was believing the word of those two witnesses, hanging and binding <laughs> that scarlet robe. It was not gonna go anywhere. And then resting, remaining there with her family, believing that God would accomplish his word exactly as she had been told by these witnesses. That's how that faith was justified by her works before all others that were unbelieving there in Jericho and that perished. When she had received the messengers and had sent 
them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith, here it is, a mere profession of faith without works is dead also. I don't want a mere profession. I want that faith that the Lord Jesus Christ gives by his spirit to his own. And so to sum this up for us, let me just say three particular things here concerning Rahab. First, she is a picture of God's mercy and grace to sinners. And we're all sinners. That's why she's called Rahab the heart. We're all sinners by birth because of Adam and our fall on him, but we're also sinners by practice and continue to be. We'll never be anything but sinners. And all the explaining by supposed moralists and legalists are not going to make Rahab anything other than what she was. See, when I was growing up, they tried to even diminish the name Harlot. They tried to say, well, she was just an innkeeper and they were the ones that received people during that time. And so she may have had people come through and there may have been prostitution going on in her inn, but she herself probably wasn't involved. That's how they try to diminish it. But you, you look up that word harlot, it means exactly what it says. She was a notorious sinner and she ran an inn like so many did back in that day that received people in and for extra money prostituted herself. This was her manner of life. And yet none of that turned God from showing mercy or grace. Why? Because he had purposed to save her as a sinner. That's God's grace and mercy. And even as Paul declared, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So that's mercy and grace. It's to the most miserable. Mercy for the miserable. In French, the word mercy is miséricorde. And the word miserable is misérable. Les misérables. So you've got that clearly set forth as being mercy, mercy to the miserable, but grace for the guilty. If any of us tries to plead anything less than guiltiness before the Lord, it's evident that the spirit of God has not done a work of grace. So this is a picture here. Rahab is a picture of that grace and mercy. But secondly, Rahab is an example of electing, distinguishing, and efficacious grace. You can continue to add other adjectives, but that's how sinners are saved. It's not by accident. It wasn't by accident that the spies stopped by her house. They were led by the Spirit of God, even as we saw in her declaration to those spies. It, it indicates, going back to our text there in Joshua chapter 2, that God directed these spies to her for this specific purpose. This wasn't happenstance. And that God had already prepared her heart by what she had heard previously, going all the way back to the crossing of the Red Sea, the Passover. That's how God works. He prepares the heart of the sinner, but then he brings the gospel to that sinner. And I use the example of the Samaritan woman but Christ said he must needs go through Samaria. That wasn't just a happenstance meeting, but God purposed it, that she be encountered by the Lord Jesus Christ. She went to the well for her daily necessities, but the Lord purposed to meet her there. And so is faith. It's not the product of any kind of natural thought or logic. It's the gift of God. As Paul declares there in Ephesians chapter two, not by works that we have done, but that salvation is by the gift of God. We're saved by that gift. And so she was one of the Lord's. And again, the works, the testimony was proof 
that God had already been pleased to do a work in her heart. It's that which reveals her to be one of the Lord's, but it's by electing grace. And what was done for her was not done for the rest of the city of Jericho. That city entirely perished, but she was preserved. But thirdly, to summarize this, that scarlet cord that she put out of the window, that was an emblem of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing that the Lord would purpose that that be a scarlet cord dipped in dye to uh, be red whenever they were preparing that for rope? You can go to the hardware store and find different colors of rope, but isn't it interesting that this was specifically prepared for this purpose to be dropped out of that window and to remain there? as a mark that those within that house were indeed the Lord's. Just like we find with Abel, the blood sacrifice. It wasn't through the works of Abel's hands, but he was received because of that blood sacrifice, blood being red. And so the Passover, the blood being taken and sprinkled on the doorposts and in the tabernacle, that blood that continued to flow and be shed every day, being a type and picture of redemption, of forgiveness, and that the Lord Jesus Christ himself would come and accomplish. Just like with a scarlet rope, she was instructed not to remove it. And even as with the Passover, God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. They were on the inside. That scarlet rope was hanging on the outside. It wasn't for them to go out and look at it. And if you keep looking at it, then you'll be saved. No, just like with the blood on the doorpost. When God saw that blood, those that were in the house, they couldn't see it, it was on the outside, but God saw it. And so with the scarlet cord, that house was passed by. Even though others were destroyed, it's passed by. What a beautiful picture we see here in Rahab. And Rahab and her family were told to come into that house where that scarlet cord was hung and it would only be there that they would be safe. We have a little chorus that we like to sing here in our congregation and if you follow our live services online on Sundays, you'll hear us sing this from time to time. It's one of my favorites. But under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe while the ages roll, safe though the worlds may crumble, safe though the skies grow dim, under the blood of Jesus, I am secure in him. What a blessing. And I pray that Rahab serves for us as that testimony that we come back to and read again and again of just how merciful and gracious the Lord God is for Christ's sake. Amen.